Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Danelle, and I work here at the library. And I want to welcome you all to the Norman Williams Library for this evening's talk with Melanie Finn. Um, thank you to Diana Kay with WCTVA, who's filming this. So all your friends who didn't come here and see this later, you could say, hey, go look at that thing, and next time come. Um, and the library relies on your donations to keep the doors open and keep events happening. So thank you for that. Um, Melanie Finn was here last year to talk about her book, The Gloaming, which um, was a New York Times notable book and a finalist for the Vermont Book Award. Um, this year's book is called The Underneath, and it's set in the Northeast Kingdom, where she lives with her husband and her children. And um, we're very happy to have you here, Melanie Finn. Thank you, Danelle, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I've just a slight caveat in that I did not sleep very well last night, so if I sort of um, suddenly turn vague or go off on a tangent, just just uh, just put it down to but down to that. Um, so I wanted to just start um, with a short reading from the very very beginning of the book, um, just so you know a little bit about the book. Um, has anybody here read it? No. Okay. So, the underneath, um, and in the underneath, uh, there are two parallel storylines. Uh, the story of Kay, who is um, a war correspondent journalist who has married and had kids, and is really struggling um, with this new role as uh, as, a, as a sort of marooned. Maro she's marooned in her in her motherhood. And she and her husband Michael have taken, uh, they live in London, and they've taken an idyllic, rented an idyllic farmhouse in the Northeast Kingdom for the summer in the hopes that um, this will uh, set their marriage back on track. Um, and of course, completely the opposite happens. Um, uh, Michael is very quickly called away. He's a documentary filmmaker, and he's very quickly called away um, back uh, to an African country. and. Um, Kay is left with the children, and she begins to suspect that all is not well with the house that she's staying in. Um, specifically, she finds some creepy things and some creepy writing, and odd, the house becomes very odd to her, and she becomes convinced that something untoward has happened to the owners. And of course, the local Vermonters are less than forthcoming um, with their answers uh, when she asks them all kinds of nosy questions. Um, in her investigation, as it were, she comes across um, the other main character in the story, Ben, who is a, a logger who hates logging and has taken up um, trafficking drugs as a way to make ends meet. And Ben is also trying to adopt a young, troubled young boy um, and help his mother, who is a terrible heroin addict. Um, and so Ben and Kay's stories um, kind of collide and intertwine. Um, and this is all set, for the most part, I should say, all set. 99% um, of it is set in the Northeast Kingdom where I live. Um, but the very, very beginning bit is set in northern Uganda, um, where Kay um, used to work as a journalist. So um, Kay and a, a photographer have traveled to a very remote part of uh, northern Uganda. There's a war on and um, a terrible um, mercenary is kidnapping children and turning them into child soldiers. So they, they cross through a roadblock and they'll pick up the story there. When you travel to such places with such intentions as ours, you must be prepared. You will need not just water, food, insect repellent, and extra fuel, but cigarettes, matches, sodas, snacks, money and small bills, phone vouchers. Mostly, you will need your wit. You will need to be funny and friendly, because these boys in uniform teeter between boredom and fear, and they are heavily armed, and they want the comfort of your good humor. At first, they refused to let us pass. They told us it was too dangerous. Some other journalists had disappeared the week before. But we promised them more cigarettes on the way back, so they let us through. Marco's contact had told us to continue to the village, 
15 miles past the roadblock to wait there for an escort. The village was, of course, ruined and deserted. All the metal roofing, furniture and doors had been scavenged. I had in my mind the Beatrix Potter story, the tale of two bad mice. I imagined General Christmas's soldiers, like Tom Thumb and Hunker Munker, carrying off the wooden benches from the school and the plastic tablecloths from the small cafe and prying off the roof from the shacks. I had the impression of mischief. Children let loose to undo the adult world because they were children, these merchants of horror, some as young as nine. We journalists jokingly called them the elves. Marco and I wandered together as he took photographs. I doubted he would ever use any of the images, but we were fidgety. We had only our professional habits. It was hot. We didn't know how long we'd be waiting for contact. An hour passed. Marco finally stopped photographing and fiddled with the settings on his Nikon. We sat in the shade of a charred wall and sweated. Another hour and another. The sun downshifted and time felt gappy, ill-fitting, itchy. I started not to care anymore. What did we want with General Christmas anyway? Whatever we printed simply fed his hunger for publicity. He had no insight, he had no grand plan, no sense of justice. He was just another asshole with a big gun. I got up and walked off for a pee, not far, just the other side of the wall, what must have been a pen for goats. The fencing had been pilfered, probably for firewood, but the holes for the posts remained. Sockets in the earth. The word socket rolled around my head, one of those perfectly innocent words, a hole once filled with something necessary, a dark space emptied out. Beside one of the holes, the sockets, there was a pile of rags in the dust. I splayed the rags open with my foot. It was a woman's dress, ripped open from the neck down the back. Possibly she'd worn it over another dress or wrap, the way very poor people lay our clothes because they are only pieces, and if they put all the pieces together, then they can make something whole. But when I knelt down to examine the fabric, I could see the rusty patina, thick and dried and flaking. There was no other evidence of what had happened here. No smears of blood, no grooves of desperate fingernails in the dust. The crumbling walls were deaf to the screams or sobs of the woman who had died here. The sparrows had turned away and refused to witness. Why watch when you can't help, when you can't understand the human purpose of knives and guns, of inflicting pain just for the hell of it? Deliberately, I put my hand on the fabric. I needed to be sure of its reality, the congregation of molecules. It was all that remained of a woman, maybe just a girl, who'd walked barefoot every day to collect water. Her bones, her body, were buried or scattered, consecrated by jackals, hyenas, and maggots and scarabs. Selfishly, I felt my own fear of obliteration. Like a climber losing a foothold, I felt the need to grab on, cling tight. But to what? The air, the dust, the still indifferent afternoon. Um, okay, so um, it's a really light-hearted read. <laughs> And um, I can assure you, though, it does end well. It does have a happy ending. Um, um, but uh, do make sure that you, um, you have lights on in the house when you read it, because I've been told it's a bit creepy. Um, and so the, the other thing, before I actually begin, um, uh, seeing as how I'm writing about the Northeast Kingdom, I today picked up the Caledonia Record, um, who, who are actually mentioned in this book, and uh, I reference in the acknowledgments. Uh, I'm an avid reader of local newspapers. And here we have man killed by multiple gunshots found in the NEK. Um, I'll just read you the beginning. Victim identified as Michael Pimentel. Police documents show, suggest drug connection. Uh, Vermont police say a man was shot to death and his body was found on a back road in Concord over the weekend. Well, this back road, it turns out, is exactly three miles from where I live. Um, and in fact, there's about two houses between me and this, uh, where this body was found. It's such a rural area. Um, so I felt slightly creeped out by the fact that I've written about this kind of thing happening. And then actually, it, it does happen in, in my neighborhood. Um, OK, uh, writing fact from fiction. Um, uh, as a former journalist, um, I get a lot of my inspiration from things that have actually happened to me and things that I read in the paper. Um, and if we get time, if I don't talk too, too long, I just wanted to try a, 
A new thing I'm thinking about, which is what happens when your projects and your books, your screenplays fail and nobody wants anything to do with them. Um, okay, so um, the first question I often get is, how did you get your inspiration for the book? Um, and it would be lovely if it was like this, that I'm St. Paul on the road to Damascus and bang, there it is, uh, the whole book is right before me, all the chapters laid out and all I have to do is sit down and figure it out. Unfortunately, that is not how it happens. Um, like most writers, I'm a bit of a magpie, so things sort of accumulate uh, over a, a long period of time and then you just kind of bundle them all together. Um, so one of the big things that um, the, the main ways in this story came to me was again, um, this is a photograph that I clipped from the Caledonia record uh, about a trailer home that had been abandoned in a place called Glover. And um, somebody had been pulling it, trailering it from one place to another. It had fallen off its trailer and they had just driven away and left it. So um, I was fascinated by this. Like, this was someone's home, rather like a snail, like that's just been abandoned. So clearly someone made a decision, like this is such a piece of crap, I'm just not even gonna bother to try and pull this to the new place. So like, who owned this? Where were they taking it? What were their circumstances? What kind of people just reach a point where they're so fed up with dealing with cheap, shitty stuff that they just say, I can't deal with it, I'm walking away, and they just drive away from this. Just literally unhitch your truck and drive away. So I started thinking about the kind of people who live these lives, that, that this is actually a place that you would consider living, um, which most of us um, are lucky enough not to have to make that choice. Um, so I did a lot of driving around the back roads of the Northeast Kingdom and I saw a lot of people trying to live in, in places like this and I, and I started to wonder about their lives and um, the character of Ben um, really sprung up from, um, from that, um, that idea um, and I had also taught uh, American literature at a local high school for about a year um, and there were a lot of kids who came from very poor backgrounds a lot of kids who worked on dairy farms, so they'd be up at 3 in the morning and they would still be at school at 7.40 uh, trying to learn. Um, so I, I became very aware of this, this other side of Vermont that is really not the side that um, we see in a place like Woodstock. Um, the second uh, real inspiration for this, um, I was house-sitting for some very, very nice people. They're both doctors. They have three lovely children and they had a really lovely house and um, I was they were gone for a couple of weeks and I was just looking after their dog and and they live around here in a nice prosperous area they have a nice prosperous life and one night it got really cold so I went looking for some blankets and in one of the closets um, there was a hole and I looked at it and it was so very definitely a fist that had been punched through the wallboard. And I thought, hmm, oh, that's very strange, because the kids were all small. There was no way a child could have punched through the wallboard. And then I sort of looked in and around the closet, and there was some very strange writing, like, inside the closet, which suggested that somebody had actually got inside the closet and shut the door and written I can't remember what it said, but it, it was weird and creepy, and I felt so deeply unsettled by this, that here were these normal people who I knew, and they were pillars of the community, and for all purposes, seemed like lovely neighbors and doctors, and yet here they had this secret, this, this underneath life. And as I went on to become a mother myself, I realized there is this flip side. There is what you expect and what you present. And then there is what really goes on in the house. And it's not always you know, hideous torture, people being shot in the basement, but there is 
a lot of discomfort and, and awful things that we do to each other that we don't talk about behind the facade of everything that is perfect. So I became interested in um, looking at this idea. Um, so here we are, lovely scenic Vermont. It's beautiful. We see it on calendars and chocolate boxes. Um, it's in movies like, uh, what is it, White Christmas, Moonlight in Vermont. Um, and so I started to think that like Vermont, in a way, was sort of a metaphor um, for uh, the underneath. Like we have this idea, people think of Vermont as being cozy with nice cabins. And yet, all of us who live here, we know that this is the stuff that's going on all the time. But people don't want to know this. They want to kind of stick with this. So this idea kind of began to wrap itself around that setting a novel in Vermont, where there was this, I this idyllic sensibility, this I ideal of what it was, and yet what was really going on, den on underneath, is something that happens in all of our lives, as well as in the state that we live in. Um, so, yes, this idea of motherhood, sorry about the badly pixelated image. Um, so, Kay obviously is a mother, um, and um, she uh, approached motherhood initially, as we all do, with this, this image, like, this is what it's going to be like. And I think most of us who have been mothers know that, that this is just really a bad lie. Um, so, <laughs> I... Um, I wanted to um, uh, just share with you a couple of, of, Kay, um, of Kay's insights as she struggles, as she herself struggles with motherhood. Um, so um, Kay, like me, and probably like many of you, uh, does struggle with insomnia. Um, when Tom had been a baby, and they and, and they'd had to move to London, and Tom did not sleep, and so neither did Kay. She had learned about the night, not the place you sleep or dream, not the place you leave, but the one you come to, wide awake at 2 a.m. As long as Kay had walked, Tom, that's her little baby, would not cry. So she paced, hour upon slow, dripping hour. She walked miles inside the room of night, across deserts, the Arctic ice, all the places she could no longer go. Tears leaked out of her like the milk Tom refused to drink. Night's shadows reflecting back to her the hunched, grey-faced woman holding a mewling baby. No one was watching, so no one could see the hunger of the baby. Sometimes Kay felt Tom's tongue slip out of his mouth and into hers, seeking the interior of her to suck her out like a raw egg. You chose this, she heard herself mumbling. You chose this, chose this, chose this. Even after Tom began to sleep, Kay didn't. Three, four hours a couple of times a week. Sometimes three days passed without sleep. In the daylight, Kay drifted, blurred, uncertain. When she spoke, she had to listen carefully to make sure the voice was outside of her, not merely in her head. But at night, she sharpened like a cat. Her heart picked up beats, rattling like a castanet. At night, she could see everything, even what wasn't there, handprints on mirrors, her sign, sound, rippled the air like water. If she shut her eyes, her heart jolted with a sharp current. She must remain vigilant. And she had sweated a sour, acrid smell, almost like fear. She smelled even during the day. She couldn't wash it off. She shuffled around the supermarket, supermarket smelling herself. Her eyes contracted in their sockets like shy fish. They ached. In the mirror, she looked over-medicated or under-medicated and people stepped away from her. Um, and in another scene, Kay has uh, been abandoned by her family, basically, because she's been kind of completely screwed up. And she goes and she gets um, drunk in a bar. Um, time slackened. Time was already slack. Great pillowy hours to fill. And the memory of the tyrant it had been the reduction of each day to a timeline, a schedule, the pettiness of minutes, the time it took Freya to eat her kale, the time it took Tom to brush his teeth. She was always counting or looking at the clock. Where are your shoes? Where is your coat? Have you made your bed? 
She was always late. Come on, hurry up, we're late. She used to feel, considering it now, that her children were eating her time, nibbling it like little rats, so that there was never time, that at never the time she thought. And they didn't understand. They had no concept of time. What is ten minutes to a five-year-old? How do you describe a minute? Kay had had to concoct reference points as long as it takes to reach the corner, from here to school, from here to Pete's house and back again. She counted in days, never in weeks or months, because a day could be comprehended. 24 days until Daddy gets back, 61 days until your birthday, three days until the weekend. What day is it today? Wednesday. So when will it be the weekend? You count the days, you know them now. Everything had to be deconstructed, everything had to be repeated. What day is it today? When will it be the weekend? Why does water have no color? Do octopuses pee? Can we have a hamster? Why do we have toes? And she would be on her knees before the child, trying shoelaces like an acolyte. Please, please, oh God, come on, we're late, we're late. There was another glass in front of her, and she was very unclear whether she or the men of the bar had ordered it. Kay gave a good impression of a woman who could hold her liquor. She gave a good impression of a woman who could drink a man under the table. Before, before, before in Addis, in Tabora, in Goma, before the nibbling, not just time nibbled, but herself, so that she was smaller than she once was, her edges marked by the many serrations of little white children's teeth. Um, so Kay, obviously struggling um, with being a mother, um, this is the Francis Bacon. This is as close as I got to the feeling of um, insomnia. Um, but this is pretty much um, the mundanity of uh, Kay's life as a mother in this book, and I'm fairly sure that any other parent in this uh, room will recognize this picture um, of the obsession children seem to have with putting stuff in the toilet that won't flush down. One of the best things I did was teach my kids how to use the plunger so that I never had to go through this. Um, so for Kay, um, the real issue became trying to understand who she was, this person who had to unclog toilets and look under the sofa for shoes, when before she had been this dangerous, somewhat glamorous journalist going to war zones in Africa. Um, so, having created these characters of Kay and Ben, um, I then had to actually write the book. Um, so, is anybody else in here a writer? Anybody? Anybody? Right. So, um, you will recognize this idea. People have this very pleasant idea, I think maybe from J.K. Rowling, that you just go to a coffee shop and you sit down and you order a coffee and you write and then you write a bestseller and it's amazing you become the richest woman in the world. Um, <laughs> however, um, in fact, writing is a torturous, um, a torturous and incredibly craft-centric process. It is not instinct. It is not inspiration. Once you have your characters and you have your themes and you feel like you know what you want to write about, you then actually have to construct this edifice that will hold all your words and that will carry your story. And this is such hard work. This is five to six hours a day sitting in a chair five days a week, sometimes getting up at four in the morning so that you can get the work done before your kids wake up and start losing their shoes under the sofa or putting apples in the toilet. Um, so, I, and, and the thing that annoyed me slightly about this was that when I looked to see online people working, there was men working and then women working, there was like women sewing or like women at a desk. I couldn't find any picture of this idea of like women building something. Women apparently, if you Google online, they don't build, they, they sew or they sit at desks. Um, so then we have the drafts, something else that um, people who, who are only just starting to write perhaps don't quite take on board. Um, so I probably rewrote this book about 12 times from cover to cover. Um, and that's not including all the little times that I went in to fix something or change something or the final edits where I had to go back. So this is really a labor intensive business. 
And I am not kidding you. I, I probably could have stacked all the, all the drafts, um, bottom to top, and, and had, had a ladder. Um, so uh, it's also not the most environmentally friendly um, profession either. Um, <laughs> so let me go back. Before we get to failure, um, I did just want to share um, one other really important thing that helps you as you deal with this draft upon draft and this sitting. And I actually had to get a special stool because my, my hips and my back started to go out from all of that sitting. Um, so as you plow through this process, which becomes onerous, and you begin to lose sight of why you started this project, because it, it just becomes really sawdust and, and noise, um, you always have to have these touchstones that you come back to. Um, and this was really my touchstone, um, which I clipped from, I think, the Boston Globe. Um, Isaiah 9, loves to draw, paint, and build. In this book, there's a young boy um, who is very damaged. His mother is a terrible heroin addict, and we hear his story almost every day. Um, and Ben, uh, despite his own history, is intent on saving this child. And he does some really terrible things in his desire to save this child. Um, but I kept this on my desk. And when I started to lose faith in the book and what it was about, I would come back and I would read this. So I'm just going to read it to you now. Sunday's Child is a weekly column featuring a child currently in foster care awaiting adoption. Isaiah is an energetic nine-year-old boy of African-American and Caucasian descent. Isaiah describes himself as curious, fun-loving, and funny. Isaiah is a very bright child who loves to draw and paint and build. While indoors, he enjoys playing with trucks, kinetics, Legos, and other games. When given the opportunity to play outdoors, Isaiah enjoys sports such as basketball and baseball. Isaiah's favorite color is red, and he loves animals. In school, he is supported by an individualized education plan as he has some learning challenges. Isaiah struggles with staying focused and learning how to be part of a group. He can become easily distracted and unable to concentrate for extended periods of time. Isaiah can struggle with appropriate peer interactions as well, but he has shown significant improvement in settings that have provide a high level of structure, clear expectations, and firm redirection. Isaiah has a significant trauma history and receives weekly therapy, individual Trauma-focused therapy has been beneficial to helping Isaiah develop coping skills and containment. Isaiah's creativity and willingness to engage had allowed him to process trauma through play and narrative therapy. Legally freed for adoption, Isaiah can do well in any type of family that would allow for a slow transition. In addition, given the gaps that Isaiah has experienced in school due, due to multiple placements, it is recommended that a supportive academic environment be significantly assessed to best address his academic, social, and emotional needs. So these children are the product of our opiate crisis. And there's a lot of talk about addiction and how do we help addicts but I don't think there is nearly enough talk about what is happening to the children who are left with these parents or taken away and put in foster care. And I look at this little boy's face and I really struggle to understand how a nine-year-old can have had so much trauma and not be in a war zone. Um, so Isaiah really became, for me, where I came back to. Um, in this book. Um, so, shall I do a, a reading? Shall I do another reading before I start talking about failure? Are we okay for time? <laughs> How are we for time? 6.37. Is everyone okay? Yeah? I'm not seeing too much shuffling or like 10-year-old, uh, my 10th graders starting to check their phones or go to the bathroom. Or, okay. I'm going to read one more section, um, which is Ben. Um, and Ben the Reluctant Logger. Uh, 
A logger must know the woods he logs. He must map out the species of trees and note the vernal pools, the marshes, the streams. He must take into account the contours of the land, the steep slopes and ridges, ravines and dells. He walks the property for days, marking the boundaries, tagging the trees of value and those destined for the wood chipper. In walking, he sees the delicate lady slipper orchids and the trout lilies and the sun dappling through the poplars. The ferns grow richly on moist soil, sheltering tiny, delicate red efts. There are bullfrogs in the streams, newts and salamanders, and six or seven species of smaller frogs. The trees are private kingdoms for owls, woodpeckers, nuthatches, chickadees, the kinglets who all survive the brutal winter. And in the undergrowth, the spiny bramble, the twisted bracken. Here live the grouse, the oven birds, and the juncos. Garter snakes and milk snakes and toads inhabit the leaf litter, the rotting logs, the moss-covered rocks. Ben heard and inhaled this, the living multi-dimensions of the forest. He knew it more intimately than the land's owners, who would never learn the dodge and dance required to walk in thick woods. They were worried about ticks. They didn't like the way brambles grabbed their clothing and skin. Mud sullied their expensive hiking boots. Walking the woods, Ben found old ruins, coils of rusted barbed wire, and the stone walls of a, fa a farmer took years to build a century ago. He often thought about those who'd first cleared the land, tree trunks the size of houses. It would take a year to clear an acre. Those men and women spent their lives clearing the forest, year upon year, peeling it off the face of the earth. And in exchange, the earth took them, took their children, year upon year, all that effort, Ben thought, all that fretting, and the woods grow back, not the big trees anymore, but a clear cut, for, uh, but a clear cut can reforest in 30 years. He found junk, too, messes left by other loggers, steel cables, plastic oil buckets, fuel drums, beer cans, or trash, tires, kids' toys, rusted fridges. The forest could not ingest such things, but embrace them with lichens and creepers. Mice claimed an old mattress, and wasps built their paper palace in a discarded pet crate. Sometimes Ben brought a packed lunch, and he'd find a quiet place away from the deer flies or the black flies. He might open a beer or two. Once, a young bear ambled out of the shade and began scratching her back against a maple. When she noticed him, she gave him an annoyed look, as if she knew the rules required her to give up her scratching and run away. But the time always came. The task was always at hand. It had to be done and Ben climbed into the cabin of the fellow buncher. He put on his ear protection and turned the ignition. The great machine trembled beneath him, all around him. The creatures of the forest had no reason to fear the noise. They could not know what it meant. The generation that might remember was gone, the memory collectively erased. People didn't understand this about logging. They didn't want to know the consequences. They thought the foxes and birds and snakes just moved somewhere else, but they died, every last one. A thousand small deaths of hunger or animal war, bodies that never accumulated but dissolved into the earth or into the bellies of others further up the food chain. Ben became their death, and there was no accounting for the dead of the forest. He turned the fellow bunch of northeast of the landing, attacking a copse of Ted and Evie's beautiful old birch. The machine's hydraulic arms grabbed the first birch in their steel embrace, and the saw jutted out from the base and severed the tree from its roots. The spinning steel spines of the deep archer ripped up the length of its pale white trunk, amputated its limbs, and then down again, rendering it smooth, 30 seconds from living tree to log. So, um, anyway, okay, so that's the underneath. Um, before I just dip into this failure thing, any questions? Yes. Um, did you? Um, work at all with loggers or, or go to a logging site because that's a really extremely descriptive piece of writing. So um, the land that we bought um, had actually been uh, really traumatically logged for mm, 30 years. Um, so when we actually bought the land um, the owner, desperate to pay his land, his property taxes, had actually just done a high-grade logging of it. So it was like he got there, and there was this apocalypse of these giant machines and mud 
everywhere. Um, and living in the Northeast Kingdom, of course, um, there's a lot of logging that goes on there, and there's also a lot of really bad logging. Um, people, sort of uh, desperate outfits, um, log really badly. Um, so I had seen both. I'm aware that there are very good loggers who can log a land very, very carefully and very generously. And then there are people who will do it just a high grade and they will just come in and strip everything out. We had watersheds completely destroyed by the logging. Um, and we had to put significant amount of money, actually of our own money, back in to, to restore some of that. So, yes. I, I, I've also, I, and if anybody's actually seen these machines, they are, it is quite horrifying how they clear land, how quickly they clear the land. And I mean, we all use paper, we all use wood. We can't say that, we can't blame them for being in this business. But I think that what happened certainly for me when I saw these logging operations, I felt like such an accomplice. And I really had to you know, question um, my own you know, use of paper. <laughs> As, um, uh, and, and then, you know, like so many other things, you know, we just drive to the supermarket in our Subarus and think that we're doing a lot better than the guy next to us in this big um, 350 Ford. Um, anyway, anybody else? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about other NEK writers, like maybe David Budville or, or Howard Mosher, and, and you know, the way in which some of that work is? So David's work, I don't know. Um, but thank you for that. I have to admit, I, I've led a somewhat isolated and sheltered life in the kingdom. I think just trying to get my own books um, out and parenting and looking after this land and my husband's off um, in various places. Um, and I also like a lot of writers. I, I tend not to read fiction when I'm writing because you, it's just like, it just, you don't want to have somebody else's ideas. But I did start reading some, um, some, uh, Frank Mo some of Frank Moser's work last year, and I loved it. It felt slightly dated, like I was reading something from the 70s, but then I haven't read his latest stuff. So, um, and I would love to be in that kind of pantheon of, of um, people who are able to articulate uh, a rural area with some kind of authenticity, which certainly he did. So. I mentioned to uh, hear more about the opioid crisis in the Northeast Kingdom. Is that big in your book? Um, well, certainly I think the Northeast Kingdom, I think it's, it's a bit, uh, I, I don't know if it's better or worse or, um, than somewhere like Rutland, which I know is particularly blighted by it. Um, but certainly because the Northeast Kingdom uh, is on these, these routes, 93 and 91, both go through, straight through the Northeast Kingdom. And it's traditionally a trucking town. Uh, there used to be a big uh, trucking industry in St. Johnsbury. Um, so I think that it's a massive transit point for drugs. So you have the, 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 the movement of drugs through the place with obviously quite a lot of stuff falling off the back of the trucks. Um, and then you have that other nasty mix of, of just poor economy, poverty issues, frayed families, um, economic depression, you know, that kind of nasty soup um, that, that really seems to uh, kind of, I don't know, attract um, these, 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 this kind of addiction problems. I mean, of course, they're everywhere. I'm sure there are addicts in, in Woodstock. Um, but I, I do know these economically depressed areas and areas that, have, that are these big transit points do, do seem to be hit the hardest. But I, I'm not an expert, and I wouldn't pretend to be. I'm a, I'm a, a, a magpie. I picked up little bits well, that, of information. That's a big thing, though, yes. Um, the, so, so Ben... Uh, the male character is trying to help um, Siobhan, who is an addict um, and has this young son. Um, and his initial desire to help her kind of becomes mitigated when he 
he really begins to realize what an addict is. Um, and that at a certain point, uh, addicts just cannot seem to stop. Um, and so, so, and then he does some things that are perhaps really immoral in, in his desire to save the boy. Um, but I, I, I think personally, I struggle um, through, through Ben with what do we do with addicts? I mean, uh, what do we do with our compassion for addicts? At what point do we, do we just say, well, we have to just jettison that compassion and take a harder line? I mean, I, I really don't know. And there's a huge moral questions for us to face as a society. And, and Ben makes a set of decisions that I don't think I would make. Um, but then I'm not trying to save a child from a, a, a drug addicted mother who's putting that child in constant danger. So and hopefully I never will be. <laughs> this is more about process. Um, I think I heard you say that you went to get the characters together when you started to kind of, the story was pulling out of your head and based on your inspirations and the pictures and the people you talked to. Did the, the characters, did you flesh them out more as you went along or did you kind of know who they were at the beginning and let them tell you the story, you know? Um, I, it's, it's a sort of a ratio. I would say that probably by the time you start, you know your character about 70%. You just kind of have a sense of who they are. And then as you write the book, um, obviously there's aspects to them that you didn't know, but you, you have to have that really strong sensibility, that authentic character. Because otherwise they just kind of drift off. And, and, and sometimes you find yourself in a bit of a bind where the story needs to go this way, but the character's going this way. And you can't actually make the character go this way. So you, you have to kind of figure out how you're actually going to make the story go with the character. Because if you try and make the character go with the story, you end up with that thing that I, I, I cannot stand, like if I'm watching a really gripping movie, and it, say it's a, it's a really intelligent woman lawyer and she's being stalked by a crazy guy and she comes into her house and then she goes into the basement without turning on the light. It's like, no, I mean, no, nobody's gonna do that. You know, and like at that point, I just get so frustrated. It's like, but it would never happen. She's being stalked by a crazy person. So you, you, have, to, you have to have that sense of character and, and you will find that it dictates your story. And a lot of times you have to just shred pieces of story because there's no way your characters are going to go there. They're not going to do that. Or, so, but then this kind of other miraculous thing happens is that as you, your characters become more and more real as you move through that remaining 30% and your characters kind of gather momentum, other doors open and, and you realize, oh, they would do that. That is something that that character would, would do. I mean, I certainly found with Kay in this book like I knew I had to get her to a certain point, but I also could see that the trajectory she would go through to get to that certain point, to, to be that person who was getting drunk in a bar, I knew that that was something she would do. Like it wasn't like, you know, my mother is not gonna end up drinking in a bar in White River Junction, <laughs> but this character would, so. Did you know that about all the characters that I think um, I had a sense that, that Ben um, was capable of real malice and I was afraid for him of, what, of him finding out what he was capable of um, and I kind of had an idea of what he would do but I wasn't 100% sure and certainly by the time I get to the very end when he has his showdown with Kay, I knew what I wanted to happen but I wasn't sure that it would happen, so the ending felt difficult for me because I knew what I wanted the outcome to be, um, but I wasn't sure if that's what if he would do the right thing or the wrong thing. So there is a certain weird, like magic element to it. Like there's a certain witchcrafty thing that goes on in addition to that and the hammering and the sawing. There is, there is a strange alchemy thing that goes on. Not enough of it, but it's definitely there. So. Did you ever 
find out more about that creepy house you were house sitting in? <laughs> the underneath of that story? So, so I, I, uh, I actually, I'll just read you what, in, in the story, in, in the underneath, so Kay um, finds this, this uh, closet, um, and I'll just, I'll see if I can find that section in the book. Um, these are the wrong kind of glasses for me. Uh, secret writing. Okay, page 81. Okay, so um, she knelt before the cupboard but didn't open it. She had a suspicion the writing wasn't there. She'd imagined it, projected it. Slowly then, she ran the nail file along the seams and popped the latch. The latch worked so fluidly, mounted by a careful, precise craftsman, the kind who kept tools in perfect order. The words were there, words were there each expression, expressing its own discreet menace. Dirty, squeal, squeal. Dirty pig, slit you open. So, <laughs> um, those people are fine. They now live in Portland, Maine, and they both... Well, she runs a family practice, and they have three normal kids. I think he's a little crazy, um, but they give no outward appearances of being depraved or odd or um, anything. And so I really don't know. I'm, I'm, and I certainly couldn't confront them. I couldn't come and say, you know, there's a fist punched in your closet and so what is that weird writing? I just, um, I, guess, I guess what it is is like if someone got inside my head, would they find that? Would they find a closet with a fist punched through the wall and weird writing? Like there was something sort of internal about that closet. Like it was inside somebody's head rather than outside it. Does that, does that, it was like, ex, it was the extra version of a, of, of somebody's mental process. And, and so it made me think about what, what was I, if, like if my, what would my closet look like? My nasty little secret latched place in the bathroom. What would it look like? So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking maybe it was the previous owner, but even still, that's kind of crass. That would paint over it or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, and it, 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 the other thing was that they, they, they didn't even seem to know it was there. And, it, and it, I, I wasn't snooping. I mean, literally, I was just looking for a blanket. And, and it was there. So um, either they were so busy that they overlooked it and it was from the owners before them, or they'd forgotten about it, or I, I, I really, I, I have no, it's bizarre. It, it's bizarre. It was bizarre. It was bizarre and unsettling. And I, and I could never put them and the closet quite together. <laughs> Did you ask about it? I felt like I couldn't. I mean, you can't really like, you know, you can't like, it's like, you know, finding weird sex toys and you can't like go, oh, uh, I just was looking for soap. You know, I mean, you can't, it's just like, you can't. And it wasn't like it was demonic. It wasn't like I'm gonna kill my children. There was nothing threatening about it. It was just creepy. Like it was just inappropriate and, and angry. Like there was anger in it and rage. So I, I felt like, Maybe the husband was just really angry, and so he just went to this closet and expressed his rage. I, I mean, I really, I really don't know. And there's a mystery there. And I, and, and I think that that's also the work of fiction, is that you never want to hit every nail on the head. You, you want to have that sense of, of the world existing completely beyond the pages of your book. Like, your job is not to answer every single question and have every single character resolve their issues. It has to be more mysterious than that because it is. Like, there's just stuff we never find the answer to. We just never find out. So, I mean, I definitely see those people when I see them, like, oh. but, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what people might find in my bathroom and that I don't know about, like, you know, if I haven't cleaned the shower or something. I don't I mean, I don't know how people might judge me. I don't think I could have resisted that. <laughs> how do you, um, what the line of, you know, telling the truth and not telling the truth? 
telling their stories in a way that is compassionate and um, authentic and reson resonating and and avoid the exploitation that that population is so prone to. Um, and like, do you ever feel like you're trying to figure that out or walk that line of, you know, mining them for their suffering almost? I think that's an incredibly um, sensitive question and incredibly difficult to answer because um, I did actually just recently get in an argument with the <laughs> the Caledonia record, um, there's certain people who write letters in constantly to that paper and there's one woman who writes on the left and she's very articulate and she's a former veteran and she's very righteous and she's very logical and then on the right there's this guy who just writes these angry bleh, rants about vegetarians and people of color and Black Lives Matter and Me Too and you know he just like he just, he cannot fathom that liberal gobbledygook. And his letters to me were really offensive. So I wrote the, I wrote a letter to the editor. I said, you know, is there any way that you could start, you know, selecting some of these letters out because they are offensive? And I actually got into it with the editor of the paper. Um, and he ended up writing a really angry retort to me on the editorial page in which he um, said, you know, this is a community forum and everybody deserves to have their say and just because you don't like it or just because it isn't articulate, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be said. Um, and obviously I, I, I agree with him on, on one hand. Um, I didn't like the fact that he was trying to uh, frame me as some kind of liberal elitist intellectual who was looking down on these crazed rats, angry rats in the paper. But I also saw his point, and it is really hard. Clearly, I am an educated travel person, and I live in a remote community, and I have uh, skills to write stories that people themselves do not have those skills. So you're right, how do I write those skills in a way that feels true to them, that feels sensitive, and that is not exploitative or somehow smirky or snobby or, or even looking at them as if they're museum pieces in like characters in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, where do they have those in, in like the Natural History Museum, you know, where you put the characters behind the glass. Um, so, yeah, dioramas. But I think that that's also just very, very hard as a writer in general. So it's not just living in the Northeast Kingdom. I mean, I've lived in, I grew up in Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania. So I have seen, you know, poverty and war and corruption and unbelievable wealth. And I've seen all of those things too that I'm not part of. So I think that the rub is more something that a writer like me, who's always been an outsider, feels anyway. You know, like I, I can't say I feel it m more in the Northeast Kingdom than I did when I was living and working and writing about East Africa. Um, there is that sense of otherness of being a part. I will never be. A, I will never be a part of the Northeast Kingdom. I will always be an outsider. But there's nowhere I can go that I will not be an outsider. So the best I can do is try and see the humanness uh, that is, is common between myself and those people who live in those crummy trailer homes that get left on Glover Road because somebody just, they've just had it. They can't deal with it anymore and they've just left it. It's better for them to just leave it for somebody else to clean up than to try and haul it to some new place and try to get it to work. When I saw that photo, um, I saw like desperation. I see that someone either, um, you know, they had a friend that like trucked it for them and then that accident happened and the friend was like, you're on your own. So they felt abandoned and they were just like, we don't have the money to hire anyone else to move that. Yeah. 
this is our home, we love it, but we're out of options, we're out of choices. In the kingdom, I mean the kingdom, I mean that, that is if I didn't get that across in that picture, because that's what I also felt too, that someone here just said, I can't, I can't fix this. Like, I don't have, I am so down on my luck that I do not even have the resources to move this to where I need to live in it. Like, somebody had just run out of everything and all they could do, I, I mean, at the bottom of our hill, just five days ago, somebody left a trailer with five, with three panels, uh, you know, those aluminum gate panels on it. And it's just, it was been there for five days. And I went down to look at it, it's got no registration and the neck, um, the neck is broken on the trailer. So clearly someone's just made a decision that it broke coming down the hill or it broke going up the hill and they just like, they couldn't fix it. They, they couldn't get another truck or they had no way to... I think it's really hard for people to understand running out of resources. And I think the only... What my time living and working in East Africa has, has given me that chance to see how people just run out. They run out of resources. They don't have very much. And then they just they just run out. And you're right, the kingdom has a separate history. Uh, it's settled by very different people than, settled, set, than settled the rest of Vermont. It is a completely different, different place politically um, and, and also socially. I mean, there's nice little clusters of liberals like myself who have college educations and we all hang out together. It's all very nice. But, you know, you don't have to go very far to see that we are a minority. And, you know, the editor from the Caledonia Record totally put me in my place. I mean, not in a very nice way, but, um, yeah, it's, you have to remember that you're the outsider. So, um, I'll just read uh, a little section, see if it, it resonates with you. Um, Jones Farm Road was not on the way to Camp Wahoo. Kay could not pretend to be taking the scenic route to collect them. She was deliberately driving in the opposite direction into this high open landscape. Pastures tumbled into woods, ro rolled up against cornfields, a crazy quilt loosely stitched with old cedar fencing. As she drove on, the theme of the landscape seemed to change, or maybe she was just paying attention. Here, she now saw, was poverty, not just hard times. Old farms struggled against the elements. A huge red cow barn sagged and slouched, and a debris of farm equipment and amid a debris of farm equipment and muddy cows. Fence posts tilted like drunks and plastic covered the windows. Further on, a scatter of mobile homes, trailers and dilapidated houses, dogs on chains, piles of junk, old cars, tires, plastic toys. Kay was used to African poverty, refugee camps and shanty towns. She'd almost forgotten people could be poor in America. The lushness of the Vermont landscape obscured such, such despair, made it almost photogenic rustic. Quite suddenly, 5899 flashed up on a fence post, a mobile home tucked in a birch grove. She braked, then realized she could easily be seen. She drove on another quarter mile, the road bisecting wide plowed fields where it dead ended. A murder of crows shrieked at her from a tree as she turned around. She drove back slowly, aware that people around here surely knew each other, knew every car. From what she could assess on her approach, the home was not well tended. It certainly was not the business office of a thriving logging concern. There wasn't a vehicle, but the door was open. A boy of five or six was riding a big wheel around the house, all stamina and focus. Then, just as Kay was passing, a woman came out. Kay only glimpsed her. She was slim, wearing pink sweatpants and a pink tank top. Jake, she yelled, get the fuck in the house. She clocked Kay's car. Clay squiggled her eyes straight ahead, assumed a befuddled expression. She was a wayward tourist trying to find the great corn maze. Um, so, um, anyway, <laughs> I'm not sure I should carry on it. It's 6, 7, 16, so I think I should, i leave failure. But I'll, I'll just show the picture that I had, which is, um, anyone know the Bruegel, the fall of a Yeah, so. 
I'll, I'll do that another time, but anyway. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me tonight.